Laurel. Laurel, are you there? I think we want to get started now. Laurel. All right, well, welcome and thank you all for joining the Global Arctic Youth Network for this seminar. The Arctic Youth Network is open to all who are interested in shaping the future of the Arctic. This current seminar is part of a series of presentations that are geared towards discussing key issues facing the Arctic and communities around the world as we prepare for the upcoming Arctic Youth Summit, which will be held this October in 2018 in Rovaniemi, Finland. So my name is Hilary Krieger. I'm going to be the moderator of this session. And during my time in Alaska, which I've only been here for about two years, I have gotten to see how people not just live, but thrive in Alaska. However, I've also seen how different changes in our environment are causing a lot of pain and suffering for us, and how we just need to do small changes on everyone's part when, that will either slow or reverse that change. So that's why I'm here. That's why I am hoping that we can be the start of that change. I'm going to pass this off to, I believe it's Laurel who's going to be starting. Um, she is going to take over control. So let me send this to you. And then we okay. should be good to go. Are we good? I can see it. Okay, go. awesome. So, good morning, or uvula lootak in Inupak. Uh, my name is Laurel Kachatag. I'm from Yunalakleet, Alaska, and um, I'm an Arctic Youth Ambassador. I Just a little information about me. Um, I just graduated from North Park University in Chicago and uh, with a degree in biology and I currently work for my tribal health organization uh, but I am here today to kind of talk about Arctic Youth Network um, and Alaska's hosting it this week which is awesome last week we had Iceland present and they talked about um, the importance of opening up land for national parks um, and the strive to try and do so and that's really awesome but uh, here on our side um, of uh, of the world I guess we are trying to talk and trying to advocate for climate change and this is especially important for a couple of the other youth ambassadors and the places that they grew up um, so here's a video of the Arctic Youth Network that I want to play for you guys. It's um, kind of who we are, what we're doing. We are the Arctic Youth Network, an international group of youth who are working to collaborate and act on the environmental and social issues that the Arctic is facing. Come join us, and together we will work to shape the future of the Arctic. So that's kind of what bringing us all together today. Um, this was is a organization uh, and just kind of a venue for young people across the Arctic, um, all across the globe, um, to get together and connect and share and discuss different environmental and social issues that um, we northern people face and so this kind of started out last year with a 
the Ar 2017 Arctic Circle Conference in Reykjavik. Uh, so in there, the first cohort of Arctic Youth Ambassadors had met with Iceland's youth environment, environmental NGO, and we had kind of gotten involved with uh, Pieter, and um, he came up to our youth summit that we kind of had for Arctic Youth Ambassadors in Anchorage in January. And we kind of just kind of like got together and discussed what we wanted to accomplish and do um, together and how we can par become partners and to create this youth network across all of these different countries. Um, and so this project will be led by youth in all Arctic regions. So Alaska, Canada, Greenland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. Um, and it can definitely include observing members of other youth from different countries that aren't it, who we caught or who we categorically call um, Arctic countries. Um, but this is very important, especially in terms of climate change, as we know that a degree of difference that happens kind of anywhere else in the world basically means two degrees of um, heating in the Arctic, and that has an effect on our um, landscape and the world that we live in. Um, so uh, just another background about Arctic Youth Ambassadors. It brings together diverse youth from across Alaska to serve as ambassadors for our communities and our country in building awareness at home and abroad about life in the Arctic. So as Alaska obviously is so much far further north than the rest of the continental U.S., um, even though, so we're United States Arctic Youth Ambassadors, so we kind of represent the country because we're the only Arctic state, um, which is, you know, kind of fascinating and fun, but it's also like amazing because uh, here we have this for ourselves. Um, and that's great. Um, but, um, so there's various people across the state, as we said, I think there's seven, 14, 17 of us, uh, not entirely sure, but we all have different um, things that motivate us in our homes and in our countries, um, our homes and our villages, sorry. Uh, so for me, that currently means um, kind of mental health awareness and just the astronomical rate of suicides across the state. Um, but for many others, especially as the people we'll hear from later t um, in the hour, it's climate change and how that affects them. Um, so here are all of the different places that we have Arctic Youth Ambassadors and where we're all from. Um, that ranges from on Alaska, um, on the Aleutian chain, all the way to Utkiagvik, um, to Juneau, and you know everywhere else in between. Um, Alaska is a huge state, so not every um, village here that we have people from are actually Arctic, but it's subarctic. But um, we're a big state, but we are small people, so we all can get together and discuss and just uh, share our different um, lifestyles and the way that different things are affecting us. So here's a little bit about me. Um, I'm from Unalakleet, Alaska, and this is a photo uh, uh, that caught by one of my friends of my village. Um, it's small, there's 750 people. Uh, we heavily rely on subsistence. Um, and it's a commercial fishing village in the summertime. So we have so many people fishing. Like I commercial fish with my dad some summers um, when I can. And yeah, that's just what I want to kind of discuss. And then I will be passing this off to Eben. Um, and he's from Utkiagvik and he had uh, created, he's a, he'd like to get into filmography and just using that platform to share his message and things that affect him as a youth from Utkiagvik, which is very far north. So here he is. Uh, hey, Laro. 
Yeah. We might do Gabe first because I'm trying to get a hold of Evan. Um, he might not be able to speak and his um, his colleague Corey was going to be able to cover him, but I haven't been able to do contact with them yet. So um, maybe we'll do Gabe first. And if we don't hear back from Evan, then I can read a quote from him about um, about Barrow and we can show that film at the end. But maybe we could do Gabe first, if that's all right with you, Gabe. All right, so uh, as Malika said, we're going to be um, introducing Ga Gabriel Stenick, who's from this uh, village of Shishmaref, Alaska, which is in between um, kind of the Bering Strait region and up north near Kotzebue. And that, you know, Shishmaref has kind of been in the news lately with climate change, but I'll pass this on to him to share his story. Gabe is actually, oh, there we go. Hello, everyone. My name is Gabriel Stenick, and I'm from Shishmaref, Alaska. I am a senior at the high school there, and I'm going to talk about uh, climate change. But my, the internet um, might be poor here, so. Laurel, if you wouldn't mind hitting play on that video, I think Gabe is having some difficulties. Okay, so yeah, here's the video from Shishmaref, um shared by Gabe, and yeah, we can watch it. I don't want my kids to go through what we are dealing with now. We used to have blizzards, you know, lots of snow. It's too warm now. When I built this house, there was still more ground out there. We're right on the edge of the beach now. When I'm older, I don't see Shishmaraf on this island anymore. Shishmaraf, Alaska is a small Inupiat village just south of the Arctic Circle. The winter sun is scarce, and when it rises, the place is frozen in twilight. It's a harsh, cold environment, a community that survives on ice. We need the ice to go out and hunt for our seals to get our fish, and we rely so much off the land and the sea. Isa Sinek is 19 and grew up on this barrier island. His parents raise huskies for sledding and harvest chunks of ice for drinking water. Today, they pull tomcod from a lagoon. The water froze weeks later than normal, the surface just thick enough to fish. Inupiat people have lived here for at least 400 years. But now Isa and his family's greatest fears are being realized. It looks like this community won't last much longer. The culprit? Climate change. Scientists say the Arctic is heating up more than twice as fast as the rest of the planet. What would be the future of this island if people don't move? Then we're gonna be underwater, John. Yeah, this, this island is done. A trip here then is like a trip into a disturbing future. After one of the big storms, almost all of your neighbors left. Yeah, all, all the neighbors move over that way to the other end. This is Esau's grandfather, Shelton Kakiak. He lives with his wife, Clara, in a tiny blue house at the edge of the earth. It's a location that's newly precarious. As temperatures rise, the ocean is freezing later and thawing earlier. That makes the land more susceptible to erosion. 
Seawalls attempt to hold the island in place, but big chunks of earth have fallen into the sea. The island is slowly disappearing. This is where the coast was expected to be in 2013, and here's where it's expected to be by about mid-century. That's probably was way out there, several hundred feet out there. And there's was lots of beach, you know. Lots of beach. Climate change is happening real fast. Shelton worries his house could fall off the edge. That kind of thing has happened before. Tell me about that picture. Like, what, what is that, that and what happened? That picture is my husband's house that he grew up in. Now it's in the ocean. It, if you went down that way today or recently, it's not there. Anyway, Iwana is a local official in Shishmaref, which has a population of about 560. And because of these dramatic changes, she and this village are faced with an almost unthinkable task. They're planning to move to a safer location. Last summer, during the hottest year on record, residents voted 89 to 78 to relocate because of extreme warming. But without funding, this village is stuck. We don't have that millions and millions of dollars in our pocket to move. If you have that, give it up. We'd like it. <laughs> It's not just Shishmaref. According to a 2009 government report, more than 30 Alaska villages are immediately threatened by erosion and flooding linked to climate change. And 12 of them are said to be exploring relocation options. And this isn't just Alaska either. As oceans warm and ice melts, sea levels are rising worldwide. Miami, Shanghai, New York, all will be threatened with flooding. A town in the Louisiana Bayou already has watched its land disappear, in part because of dams that block vital sediment. But now climate change is threatening to make things even worse. And last year, a local tribe got a $48 million grant to relocate. It's unclear if Shishmaref will be able to get similar funds. Climate change refugees are what we're going to become in the next few decades. Some elders, including Esau's grandparents, want to stay. But Esau thinks this community has no choice. In January, Arctic sea ice was at a record low and temperatures in the region have been soaring to 20 degrees above average in early February. He says the only way to survive is to get out. If you ask the older generations, like my grandfather, their views are totally different. They want to stay on this island forever and ever. But to me, I think we have to relocate so that our future generations can still be alive. Climate change and relocation have become deeply personal for him. Esau's uncle Norman, Shelton's son, fell through the ice and died on a hunting trip in 2007. Elders say the ice where he died should have been frozen that time of year. Esau believes that climate change played a role in his uncle's death. There's not a day that goes by that I do not think of him. He's always on my mind. He's always in my heart. The death propelled Esau into advocacy. Now he's an ambassador for youth in the Arctic, getting recognized by the Obama White House and attending international climate negotiations in Paris. I really love that because I get to tell my story. I get to tell that climate change is real. It's a subject that's difficult, but he's not bitter. I don't blame it on one person or a group of people. It's all our fault. It's not 1940s anymore. We can't use fossil fuels anymore to heat our homes to use for our energy. We can transition from dirty fossil fuels to renewable energies. And as for those who deny the science of climate change, Esau offers them an invitation. Come to Shishmaref, he says. Up here, the facts are undeniable. Uh, Gabe, can you hear me? I can hear you. Hello? Yeah. Um, do you want to add any comment to the video that we just watched? Um. So, uh, 
Gabe, are you seeing any of this happen out at Shishmaref? Yeah, with the uh, the erosion, um, there's this uh, one part of the island that um, that's like really susceptible to uh, erosion, and that's um, the west side of the island, um, and that's. Are you guys looking into moving your village? I had no idea that that was something that was going to be what's happening up here. What was that? Um, the, I, I couldn't really hear that. Are you guys looking into moving your village right now? Yeah. Um, there's um, a couple like options for relocation, but that's all costs millions of dollars, and that's um, not really good for the village um, with all the difficulty funds and just moving a village in general. I definitely can understand. Goodness knows that moving is difficult enough for me. <laughs> That's just one person. Um, so um, with relocating, that would cost like 300 million in like a small town like ours does not have, like, not even close to that much money. So. It's, uh, it's going to be tough, but hopefully we can like slow down that process and have uh, the erosion and like go down. Do you know how we can slow down the process of climate change? Um, I don't really know if there's a way to slow down the uh, climate change, but uh, the sea ice that we have, um, it's like a kind of the, a barrier for erosion. It kind of prevents it, but with that um, leaving earlier in the year or um, forming later in the year, the erosion process speeds up. So without that sea ice, that erosion speeds up. And But there's a seawall that you can see in the picture of Shishmara. Um That seawall has kind of or it has helped with uh, the erosion. It has slowed it down, and um, it's um, it just like really helped with that seawall. But with the areas that are not protected with the the wall barrier, um, the erosion is um, like like really sped up, and it's. And that's with the west side of the island. I was going to say uh, it's like actively eroding right now with um, the waves crashing into the the land and it's been eroding faster than any other part of the island. And another part of that is uh, due to the thawing of the permafrost in that area. And with the thawing of the permafrost, that means um, it kind of speeds up because uh, permafrost acts like a kind of barrier for the 
corrosion and um with that dying permafrost it gets um you could say weaker and it's not as strong as uh is areas with kind of frost. Gabe, it's Laurel. Would you be able to also um, talk about how much as a native person, your lifestyle relies on ocean sea ice um, and just the harvesting and subsistence use of marine mammals? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a community. Hey guys, community. hey guys. Please mute your, your phone. Because I, I can hear my, I can hear my echo. echo. Is that better? All right, so I think we're ready to go back to Gabe if that works. So, Gabe, please tell us about uh, how um, the harvesting of uh, marine mammals and the usage of sea ice is important to you as a native in Alaska. Yeah, um, as I was saying, Shishmarap is a native community and it like, relies heavily on um, subsistence hunting. And a lot of that is during the spring and fall times when the seals and the marine mammals, like there's a bearded seal and the walrus. Um, we hunt those for our subsistence and that's really important. And But with the sea ice like receding earlier and forming later, it that um, season kind of shortens. So that means like less food for the village and the people and but living uh in rural villages in alaska that's really expensive so going to a store and buying like hamburger or steak or whatever um that costs a lot of money and for a lot of people they don't have that money and it's just easier or less expensive to go out like on the ice and catch like some seals or walrus and um like providing food for your family or whatever and but that just costs less and, and the food is uh healthier too so but it's really important this um past year the sea ice left like really early and so it kind of receded in february and it um got there's like almost no sea ice at all during february and um it it formed later again but it wasn't as strong and so um that really uh like hurt the uh, hunting season this year and that that timeline for hunting is like in may or april and should like be lasting until june but it was uh it took a span of like only a couple weeks for that and it made it like really dangerous for the hunters that do go out and catch seals for food. Okay. Um, so thank you, Gabe, for giving us that story of Shishmaref that's rather sobering. Um, Maka, uh, apparently we we are unable to get a hold of um, Eben or Corey in Ukiagvik. Yeah, yeah, I haven't heard a response from them. So um, 
I can read a statement from Evan that he sent this past week. Um, it's it's uh, specifically on the changes that he's seen, and we can show the video that he has filmed and edited himself. If that if that sounds good, that works for me. What's the quote? Great. So um, a little bit about Evan. Um, Evan is from Okavik, from Barrow, Alaska, the farthest northernmost city in the United States. Um, I think he's 18 years old. He is a avid photographer and videographer, and um, and his work is really incredible. Um, we push it out sometimes on the Arctic Youth Ambassador uh, Facebook page. I don't think he has a website set up yet, but um, keep an eye out for him because I think he's going to be he's going to be a really well known photographer in Alaska um, as he continues to develop his work and his skills. Um, and so. Uh, Evan and I were talking about change in the Arctic, and we're working on um, we're working on telling a story of his experience um, for an article that we're both working on. And for uh, for that article, he did share the following. Um, Evan says, "Throughout the 18 years of my life, I've seen changes to my land unlike any other American teenager has." My people rely on continual hunting year round to keep our bodies warm during the cold, unforgiving months of the winter and spring and active during the warming months in the summer and fall. The place that we keep our food is called an ice cellar. An ice cellar is a natural underground permafrost laden cold food storage. And during the spring and summer months, the permafrost has melted and flooded the ice cellars, spoiling our food for the past year. Yes, we have grocery stores, but it's too expensive to get beef and other protein from the stores. The food from the stores, the indigenous food is healthy. And then the food from the actual stores in Barrow, the non-native food isn't as good for indigenous health because Native people have stomachs that are accustomed to a native diet, such as whale and caribou, and the other kinds of foods that our ancestors have eaten for the past 7,000 years. Um, what's interesting about Evan's quote is that he talks about food security. Um, food security is something that is threatened throughout um, all over Alaska. Um, where I'm from, down in southeast Alaska, in, in Yakutat, Alaska, subsistence, salmon, uh, subsistence fishing for sockeye salmon has been closed this summer, and no one is able to get, you know, the traditional food. Um, as, as a parallel to Barrow and many rural villages in Alaska, like Evan said, when you try to buy food from the store, it's extremely expensive because these stores and these these places are very rural. And when the local stores have to bring in food from Anchorage, they have to pay for the pallets that it's shipped on for air cargo too. And so they're paying for the weight of the pallet as well as the weight of the food and then like the cost of the product itself. And so that's why the food's really expensive. Um, and, you know, the CNN video that we watched, Esau, I, I remember him telling us once that in Shishmaraf, they called the soda there Eskimo water because um, a lot of them would drink the soda because it was cheaper than the water. The water bottles were heavier. And so since the water bottles were heavier, they cost a lot more to buy from the store, to buy like a 24 pack of, of water. And so a lot of them would choose, you know, the more affordable hydration as a result. And that's the reality in a lot of these places. And, um, you know, in Barrow, like Evan said, like they traditionally have stored their food in underground ice cellars, but because of the changes, the food is being, you know, the food is being ruined by the flooding. And so food security is really important because not only for that, but because of access to the locations and places where indigenous food is available. 
so many communities have to have access to go out on the ice to get out to hunting areas. And this year, I know that uh, I think whaling opened up a month earlier because of um, because of the ice just not being present. I think this was back in uh, I think this must have been back in March or April. I remember him saying it opened up four weeks earlier than it has in history because uh, because of the ice. A problem with that. Tied to that, though, is, you know, the animals. The animals have been following, like, really specific and special migration patterns for hundreds of years. And as the water changes, it changes those patterns as well. And that's how it connects to the experience down in, in southeast Alaska with the changes in the salmon in my own community. Is that, um, you know, we have these, we have all these different um, experiences that relate to the threat of our own of our own food and and for the question of food security you know one having access to the hunting places to um, you know the animals themselves or the um, you know the berries and the food that we gather being affected by the warming temperatures because it's a very they're very delicate to those extreme changes in the environment and three just the cost of food the cost of living in these communities is is a lot more expensive than living in an urban area and we see people that choose to relocate to a hub city or relocate to one of the larger cities simply because it's um you know it's more affordable for their family they um you know it's it's getting harder and harder to have access to our traditional foods for for thousands of years and so I appreciate that Evan chose to um, focus on that topic because I think it's an important question of understanding how how climate change is affecting food security. Um, and so I think it'd be good now to move on to uh, Evan's video, um, which I think he filmed and edited last year or the year before. And, um, and Laurel can go ahead and pull that up. Thanks, Laurel. Looks as though Laurel is having some technical difficulties. Um, let me see if I can get it playing. Oh, never mind. And there we go. Okay. I think we are still having some technical difficulties. Um, Laurel, I'm going to steal the controls back from you and I'm going to see if I can get the sound working, okay? So um, you can now all see my screen. Let me see how this goes. There we go. All right.
All right. So apparently we still can't hear what's happening. Let me see if I can make this be louder somehow. I don't know. Does anybody have any hints as to how I can make the sound play through? When I un unmuted myself. Okay, so let me. I'm going to restart the video and put the phone on top of the com computer.
Okay. So let me get back onto this slide. And then, once again, very powerful stuff. Um, Maka, do you have anything that you wanted to add? I guess, um, I guess just relating to, you know, it's when we, when we try to um, help someone understand the complexity of, of the fear of being disconnected from a place, I suppose I would say it's not just trying to think of how it would feel if you were forced to move out of your house or where you live now, but if you imagine you know, the place that's most sacred to you and your family that um, that is a place like where you grew up, a place that's of, of utmost significance to you. And a lot of these communities, you know, their ancestors had a very, um, very symbiotic relationship with the land. And that relationship, um, served the base for how these cultures grew and evolved and developed was the relationship with the land. And so um, thinking of what it would be like to be forced to move, what it would be like to, you know, have to go through this, I think is something that's, it's, it's a reality of, of, of a lot of rural Alaskan youth. And so, you know, a big part of what we do is to you know educate on educate on these experiences that are real ex educate on these cultures and these communities that are resilient and strong and understanding that there is a lot of resilience and strength in these communities despite you know the the challenges and the obstacles that are ahead and that i think with the arctic youth network a big part of what we want to do is to you know bring together the youth that are going to be affecting the policy soon and then in the future to, to look at ways that we can make sure that seven generations from now that these, uh, that, that our children can have a home that they're not afraid of losing. And so I guess I just kind of wanted to connect it to that and, um, and then, um, Laurel, do you have anything else for the closing? I think we had one more slide that just shared a little bit more about the Arctic Youth Network. Let me get that open. Um, I, I already, I stole the, the um, command of the screen from Laurel, so, you know. Uh, no problem. One of the things though that I wanted to mention uh, was the, that, or one of the parts that Gabe was talking about earlier um, of our food security and what Maka kind of touched on and the way that we rely on ocean ice um, for safe harvesting. So, you know, using the ice to go hunting for marine mammals. But also, I also wanted to touch base on the fact of um, how carving and um, also using every part of the animal um, is very important to us. It's very, you know, we don't just go for an animal and just take the meat on the inside or the blubber from the inside, but we use every part. We use the um, blubber and render it into seal oil and we use that for everything and it's my favorite, but um, we also, um, um, you know, use the furs. We tan the furs and Shishmaref, I believe, has a tannery and Shishmaref women and maybe the men too are known for their, um, sewn items, the way that they make seal fur hats and the way that they make seal fur slippers and mittens. And, you know, it's just beautiful work done using every part of the animal. Um, not to mention, not to forget to mention, um, as well at the ivory carving in Shishmaref, they're known for it. And it's amazing. And, you know, like, some people have issues with ivory, especially coming from um, Africa and that has led to an ivory ban. But um, that, you know, that affects us. And that's what I want to say also is like our, not only do, does our food come from the ocean and marine mammals and sea ice, um, but also from the land, but it also like gives us 
and gives people a way of making an income for themselves when jobs are already scarce. Um, so it's also very important in the economical aspect as well. So I wanted to mention that. But for the closing slide, I, so here is our use network and it has represent, representative responsibilities. And I'm just gonna read them out loud. Uh, number one, maintain communication via a grade medium. And I believe that's yeah, via email, uh, Google Docs, or the Facebook page. And then dedicate time to Arctic Youth Network preparations. So one to two hours per week. Um, number three, engage other youth in your country. Promote at-large participation in Arctic, Arctic Youth Network. <laughs> Be ready to step outside your comfort zone and try tasks that will help us grow. Uh, and number five, send one to three representatives to the 2018 CAF Biodi Biodiversity Congress in Rovaniem, Finland, in October. So um, I would like to open up kind of this area along with Hillary to questions that people may have um, and just shoot away. Thank you, Laurel. Once again, um, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute your phone um, and then just either shout them out to us. You can also chat uh, and I'll read them. Um, yeah, we're an open book. Uh, <clears throat> I just, I know that I've lived in Alaska for two years and I've, I've gotten to meet a lot of people in the rural areas and it's, it's fantastic. It's it's fascinating to sit down and chat with people and and to say, you know, how are how are you going to survive the future? Because I mean, things are changing, and their response is always, you know, it may be changing, but we can change along with it if we have to. Um, at least that's the way it was when I was in Bethel. Uh, I there was somebody who said that this is the place that's always been, um, and that's just that's very powerful to me whenever somebody feels as though that this is has been their home from now until time immemorial. So yeah, anybody have any questions for the presenters? Otherwise, I'm going to keep talking. <clears throat> All right. Um, so I, I don't know if there's anybody on who can answer this, but um, I've I've tried whale, um, and it it was it was kind of gelatinous, and it, I thought it was it was strangely delicious. Um, how how were you guys when you first tried your first piece of whale or your first um, native food source? Um, I know that a lot of you or the majority of you have grown up in these uh, in a native village, but just asking. Okay, so Samantha Macbeth asks, um, how is the youth network in Alaska engaging people in the U.S. about these issues? Does anybody have an answer? Laurel, Maka? Yeah, I could share a little bit about that. Um, so the so the Arctic Youth Ambassadors um, is a program that does participate in the Arctic Youth Network. Um, we partner with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, and um, through that partnership, we um, we work together to uh, you know attend different conferences of which the youth ambassadors can. Um, you know, share more information about these experiences and about our work. Um, we recently went to the um, Arctic Encounter Symposium um, earlier this year. That was down in Seattle, where the ambassadors got on stage and did one of the, the last opening for the plenary session. And each of them, you know, introduced themselves and talked about their experiences. Uh, we also do work within state, so whether it's from the, um, the Alaska Forum on the Environment, we're planning to do work within AFN, and then um, making sure that we're pushing out relevant content that educates about these lives in the Arctic. So we use 
um, social media platforms such as our Facebook or Twitter and our Instagram to to share content related to these experiences in the Arctic. And um, we're you know we're always constantly fundraising. We're always constantly working towards you know creating experiences that the youth can share their voices. Um, in addition to that, we just got word that uh, Gabriel Stanek from Shishmaraf was was chosen to speak on a panel and it is hosted by World Wildlife Fund by Lyft, as well as moderated by Teen Vogue. And that's going to be happening in September. And we're hoping that um, that will bring these experiences um, of these ambassadors and these young people that will also be speaking on the panel about youth experience of climate change all around the world. We're hoping that that, um, that can gain traction and, and gain a larger audience to really um, instigate the kind of conversations that need to be happening throughout the rest of the United States. Fantastic. Thank you, Maka. Um, so we have time for one more question if anybody wants to ask it. Um, Anyone? Well, all right. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. This has been a presentation from the Global Arctic Youth Network, where we are working to shape the future of the Arctic. Join us for future seminars. So that would be this time every Sunday uh, for the next, I believe, six Sundays. Uh, and we are going to be at the upcoming Arctic Youth Summit um, in the first week of October 2018 in Rovaniemi, Finland. And please come and help us share our vision of the Arctic with the world. And that's it. I hope you all have a fantastic day. Thank Maybe you so I'll much for moderating. No worries. And thank you. Thank you.